Welcome everyone. My name is Professor Raman Bedi and I'm the chairman of the Global Child Dental Fund. And we uh, look forward today to uh, a, a, a next lecture on our special care dentistry series. I want to welcome uh, Matana Katarad, who is at Tamasat University in Thailand. Uh, this is a really important subject area that we're going to look today because it's the practical tips that actually help us all when we manage patients with special care needs. And so we're looking forward to your lecture. And on the panel, we have uh, Professor Callum Durwood, um, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Dentistry at the University of Putusata in uh, Cambodia. And Dr. Jacob Johns, who's Associate Professor at the Department of Restorative Dentistry at the University of Malay. Welcome everyone. Matana, thank you so much for giving up your time and we now look forward to hearing your lecture. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Professor Brady. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. <clears throat> so the title today is the tips for managing a patient with um, special needs. And the outline that we're going to talk about today uh, includes the access, whether it's the design and equipment that we need uh, for our clinic to be accessible to patients with special needs, or setting uh, design and clinics uh, or equipment when we go out to provide care outside the dental office. And then we are going to talk about the safe transfer and positioning of the patient to uh, prevent aspiration to reduce spasticity or to reduce the pressure sore. And we would have a little bit of time at the, at the very end to talk about some tips on managing medically complex patients. So when we talk about a design of a, a dental clinic, there are four issues that I like to, to emphasize. Uh, first one is, is quite obvious, a universal design, how to make our clinic accessible to everybody, okay? Uh, and, but the second one is the healing environment, whether it's the, uh, the part of a spiritual support, the part about uh, making it, it uh, warm and making it less um, uh, like anxiety or threaten to the patient. Okay. And the third one would be how to make it dementia friendly environment because uh, uh, we have a more and more patient with cognitive impairment coming to see us. And the last one, uh, how to make uh, the clinic uh, ready for the, for the COVID-19 era. But before the patient comes to our clinic, uh, as a dental professional, I think we should be also an advocate uh, to have um, public transport or something similar to, to provide better access to care to the patient as well. Okay. And once they are in front of our clinic, the specification of universal design starts since the parking lot and the angle of the ramp, uh, the shape of the hand, handrail, uh, the size of of the door and how it's open. Also, you can find like standard of this specification of universal design online. Uh, if you have some equipment extra to help ease the access of the patient with special need, that would be lovely. Okay. And also once we're inside the clinic, I think at least one dental unit, if, if you have many dental units in your clinic, at least one unit should be not just wheelchair accessible, but also accessible for a, a stretcher. And this is what it looks like at our hospital. Uh, we try to have it as spacious as possible uh, for the hallway Two wheelchair has to be able to, to go uh, across each other. And then you can see that we, we are lucky that we have uh, the greeneries, the trees outside our window. But after the pandemic, we have to have a big renovation. The same clinic is now turning into completely isolated room with a negative pressure operating area and a positive pressure wetting area. This is another clinic uh, on, at the faculty 
side, not at the university hospital side. Uh, there are some tips on the waiting chair. The, the waiting chair has to be not too high, not, not too low and not too high. If it's too low, the, it will be difficult for the patient to get up. And there has to be um, an armrest so that the patient can help themselves to go up. And the cushion has to be not too soft. If it's too soft, it will be too difficult as well. And we make sure that stretcher can go in operating room. Uh, and for the dental unit itself, uh, we prefer the cart type so we can move around instead of the arm type of the, uh, of the dental unit. This is another example from Japan. Uh, you can see that there's, this is a cart type that we can move uh, it around. So if the patient come in a stretcher, we can, we can still uh, treat the patient in the stretcher as well. And the dental unit as this, uh, either is four hinge or five hinge is, is okay. Right. I'll, I'll let you know later why it's better than the typical dental chair. And there's some, you have to provide some areas uh, to storage the, the wheelchair. In Japan, they just have enough space to put the wheelchair at the back of the of the cabinet. In Stockholm, in Sweden, they have this uh, just small corner and they put the curtain around and they put a wheelchair of every patient inside that curtain area. So it doesn't get into the hallway. And it, this is uh, one of the like fire court as well. Okay. Also in Stockholm, uh, this picture shows also the healing environment. You can see a fish tank, you can see a picture, the photos of the nature and the use of the color. Uh, the high contrast is usually very uh, useful for older adults in general, but also very, very good for the patient with cognitive impairment. So you can see that the brain can be directed into the area that you want the patient to be focused on. And also you can see that there's a arm armrest for the chair and the cushion is not too soft. This example of the of the washroom of the bathroom use high contrast color for a patient with cognitive impairment. And you can see the mirror here. There's a uh, there's a blind at the mirror in these two pictures because in the severely uh, cognitive impaired patient who cannot recognize their own reflection, and then they are afraid of the, uh, of the picture on the other end of the mirror. So sometimes we have to put the blind down so that it doesn't scare the patient. And follow standard specification of universal design of the washroom. Okay. So now if we want to go outside our dental office, uh, to see patients um, in the hospital, whether it's the just normal uh, inpatient wards or ICUs. Uh, we go see patients in long-term care facilities or we visit them at, at their homes. Okay. So what should we provide? Uh, there's a study uh, from Taiwan say that there are two main reasons that people are uh, not willing to go out to see patients outside of the dental office. The first one is the complex medical history of the population. And the second issue is the, the dentist's unfavorable working condition that they said is, is outside their comfort zone. So how to overcome these two barriers? The first one, try to get the medical history before you see the patient. When I was in Canada, the clinic manager would call the nursing homes or the, the, the patient's next of kin to provide just paper-based photocopies of the medical records uh, of the list of medication. Uh, you can have a print referral letter, but, but now I think I've got to edge it for a long time, but now mostly we don't have, we don't even have to use paper-based photocopies anymore. So it can be the photo or document file that the patient can show us from the smartphone. Um, there is also some papers published about other information prior to the appointment besides the, the medical history or the list of medication. Because of COVID uh, pandemics, we can get uh, as much as possible information. So you can do actually the uh, like part of the dental consultation by phone or by other uh, mobile apps 
get all the sweep complaint, get all the like history taking done before the patient come. So we make sure that the patient have to come on site or we make sure that we go to see them and when we, we have proper information, we, pro, uh, we prepare all the equipment that, that we need. And there's an example from the UK, the National Health Service has launched a red map project. Uh, so every resident uh, in nursing homes, in long-term care facilities uh, has this red map that includes the list of medication, all the past medical history. And this is the, is the two, about two pages document of like identity of the patient, what they like, what they don't like, what they like to be called, uh, their former, uh, like the history of their life uh, into pages, which is, it, it helps a lot. And, and even though we don't have like electronic uh, link of database, we can also use, use the example of the NHS red back scheme as well. So when they go to the hospital, to the emergency room, they bring the red bag. So similarly, when they go to see a dentist, they can bring the red bag. Or when we go to see them at their home, we can have this red bag open and then we have all the information that we need. Okay. And this is a paper published recently about what kind of information we can get beforehand uh, before we actually see the patient in person. So it also assess the risk, uh, the vulnerability of the patient uh, for getting COVID-19 uh, as well. Whether, so we can, can weigh the risk and the benefit of seeing the patient in person. Okay, so what to bring? Uh, I'll show you in some, in some of the pictures uh, following this slide. Uh, the portable mobile unit right now is just a suitcase is, and it can provide like, all type of, of dental care. Like you can, they even provide like ultrasonic uh, scalar with the, within the suitcase as well. So it's very convenient, uh, much, much better than before that we had to carry like a big mobile unit around. Okay. Uh, when we go out, sometimes we have a designated room in a nursing home, whether it's a meeting room or uh, like um, a room that they provide for for rotation of eye doctors, for dentists, uh, for podiatrists that can use that uh, particular room. Or we can go out and about to patient's room or to patient's home as well. Okay? So following this slide, there will be examples from uh, Canada, Sweden, Japan, Thailand, and also in the US. So the first model is to have a van or a car. Uh, at Tamasat, we also have a uh, like a pickup much smaller than the, the one that Iowa, Iowa has, but also with uh, one unit, dental unit as well. In Stockholm, in Sweden, they use this mobile uh, dental unit uh, fully equipped, just like one suitcase, and they have another suitcase for, for portable x-ray okay. with the shield around the tube. And they go see the patient in the nursing home to the to the patient's room. Some example from Canada and from Japan and also again from Sweden. If you see the patient in the hospital, sometimes you just need like a basket or a bag. And inside, I like to emphasize that it's very important to bring uh, oximeter. Uh, oximeter will help us uh, to measure uh, not just purely oxygen level, but also if the oxygen level drops more than three percent, that means the patient might have a chance of aspiration. So we can stop uh, all the uh, activities uh, with the patient and then assess again whether they need self or not. Okay, and this is the bow mirror with LED light, so we can change the tip, a disposable tip, uh, and we clean. Uh, the, 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 the shaft and then we can use it for the patients that we see. Okay. Uh, extraction, uh, dentures can be done in the hospital bedside. This is in Thailand. Uh, we are lucky that dentists is part of the primary care team. So we usually go visit patient at home uh, with either a nurse 
or a physical uh, therapist. And we just have a basket, two baskets, one for the clean equipment and another one for the way back for the, for the dirty uh, equipment and waste. Uh, so that's the end of the how to ease uh, access for the patient. And the second part is once you're in our hospital, in the clinic, then what would be the safe transfer from the wheelchair or how to position the patient to, to be the safest way. The gold standard um, is the ceiling lift or ceiling hoist, uh, which helps not just the patient, but also helps the care provider as well. So it looks like this with the hydraulic uh, function, just up and down, left and right, that's all. And this is the chair, uh, four hinge or five hinge. There's a ceiling lift and there's also like portable lift as well. But if you don't have that, like in like uh, in Thailand, is we have it in Thailand, but it's very expensive. Uh, we have used something similar concept, but with manual uh, lift by by people. But we also use the same uh, technique with like a a cloth. Uh, thick enough to wrap and the cross are uh, prepared by the physiotherapist. Or okay. uh, some comes with handles already. So this is quite uh, a safe transfer. If the patient can still bear some weight on their feet or their foot, uh, the gate bell is a is a is another way. But the physical therapist said just some kind of belt, any kind of belt would be okay or even a big piece of cloth that you can wrap around the waist. The tip is do not let the patient put their hands on your neck. It will hurt your C-spine if, if the weight comes uh, too abruptly. So try to use the shoulder or scapula when the patients um, uh, try to hold us. And also with this type of chair, you can see that the patient can actually transfer themselves if they can bear weight on uh, their foot or their feet. Okay? Even if they are heavy paresis, only one side works, still with this type of chair, it's a lot easier for them to, to, to transfer it. There are some uh, turn table to transfer the patient as well. And if you know that this visit, you're going to make just oral examination and no drillings, no scaling, like no other treatment, and you have enough space behind your dental chair. Most of the dental chair headrest can be flipped into the other side, and you can just move the patient's wheelchair and then use the headrest as the head support for the patient to do oral examination and it can still be close enough to the dental suction. And if the patient comes with a reclining chair, a jury chair, you don't even have to transfer the patient. You can, you can uh, do the treatment within the, the reclining chair with the head support. So the head support is the most important part. If the patient comes uh, in a stretcher, Make sure that you, you get yourself with the right ergonomics uh, position when you work as well. And do not place the stretcher right next to the dental chair. Have enough space for your assistant to go in to stand between the dental chair and the stretcher. So that way you can work properly uh, without having to, to like stretch yourself too much or bend yourself too much. Okay? And if the stretcher makes the operator and make the operating area far from the usual place, then you have to extend your dental suction with the latex tube. And then everything will work just fine. Some patient has a problem with their uh, like secretion and sputum. Uh, so if your clinic has this portable, uh, portable suction, extra to the dental suction that would be nice. Or if the patient has it at home, 
uh, when you phone them to confirm the appointment, also confirm that they should also bring the portable suction with them as well. So the position to reduce the risk of aspiration is to reply the chair 30 to 60 degrees. Always, always have the cervical neck support, okay? And uh, provide enough time for the patient to rest and make sure that the patient is well like uh, awake. If not, then there's a risk of uh, aspiration. You have to be more careful, okay? especially when you uh, had a uh, patient sedated. Okay. So you can see that uh, sup supply position is not recommended. So it has to be with the back support and with the head support. Okay. And the reason is just uh, normal gravity, uh, the, the trachea, the air pipes in front, right? and the esophagus and the type, the, the pipe for the food is at the posterior side. So we tilt so that if there's something go wrong, then they would go into the right uh, channel. Right? And in patient with heavy paresis, uh, try not to move the head of the patient, but if you need to do it, move it to the affected side, to the weak side, so that the strong side can work properly. Some of us tell the patient to tilt their head so we can see for a visual, better visual, if we want to prep the tooth or if we want to clean the tooth. But if we tell the patient to tilt their head, turn their head into the strong side and let the weak side open, it will increase the risk of aspiration for the patient. Okay. So when to recline 30 degrees, when to recline 60 degrees, uh, it's all about pressure saw. If the patient doesn't have pressure saw, then you can uh, you can recline like at any degrees. But if the, the if the patient has pressure saw, the standard position would be semi fowler position or thirty degrees. Um, the type of dental chair, the five hinge or four hinge, is recommended also because of uh, the spasticity of the neurologic uh, defect patient, they would have more spasticity if the legs or the arms are stretched out because of these stress reflects. Uh, so if we, if it's elongated, it will show more strength, uh, more reflex. So we want the patient to be in, in the position similar to this picture. Okay, so have, have the arms uh, closer to the body, the side of the body, and put the arms uh, with the support, all arms and hands with the pillow support. And uh, do not lie like supine if you are not like uh, tilt properly. Uh, if you are sitting down, if your legs are, are not straight, it will reduce the spasticity. So you can see for patients who are frail, whether it's spasticity or hypotonia, have put them to help, okay? Eliminate the, to eliminate the spasticity. This is a picture from, from Sweden. So there's a cushion that you can clean properly with just like KB wipe. Uh, so you can you can reuse it with, with another patient as well. Okay. So it's water repellent. And have the see, so no, no straight leg, like like dental bed, just uh, have the knee like this, like they're, they're sitting have the foot support and it will reduce the, the spasticity of the patient. Okay, so many boost posture and make sure there are other factors involved, like whether they want to go to the washroom or not. Uh, is there any pain, stress, fatigue, infection, or some problem like inborn toenail would also increase the spasticity. Uh, too tight of the, the cloth, or uh, being too cold, too hot, high humidity, all this uh, combined, uh, we'll trigger the spasticity as well. So we have to reduce all this with also maintain a good posture. Um, with patients like horse stroke or Parkinson, they would have medication to reduce spasticity and rigidity. So make sure that the patient takes the medication before, or for us to make sure that the dental appointment is uh, uh, at proper time that the medication is already kicks in. 
Normally, the anti-spasticity medication will take only like 10 minutes, 20 minutes to kick in. But for Parkinson's like rigidity and dreamer, it would take about an hour and a half to two hours to kick in. So if the patient take the medication at eight in the morning, then you would make an appointment at 10 in the morning, for example. Okay. And some patient has to, cannot just lie down on their back, they have to tilt uh, a little bit, but make sure that they don't put the weight onto the, onto the shoulder too much. Okay. Always have cervical uh, pillow, the neck pillow. Okay. This patient has uh, dementia, so when we tell them to lie down, they don't lie down. When we recline, like when we get the, the chairs up, right? They just get away. And when we recline the chair down, they still do not lie down. So we have to have a lot of towels and pillows and, and put, to set the position like this. Uh, this is another trick uh, for patient with cognitive impairment or psychological problem but with a lot of anxiety. To reduce the anxiety, uh, in Sweden, there's a clinic for homeless and psychiatric uh, patients. This is a doll, uh, a puppy doll, with, you can put, put the battery in. When you turn it on, it breathes in and breathes out. So they put this doll on the tummy of the patient. So the patient holds the doll and then the doll breathes in and breathes out, just like the real puppies. So it, it is the anxiety for the patient and it reduces the spasticity of the patient as well. Okay, so this is the last part. Uh, there are some tips on some uh, type of medical complex patient. Okay. If the patient do not open their mouth, how, how can we open their mouth, okay? First, desensitization. Uh, like you massage the TMJ, you massage the chi, you massage under the lips or the lips, and then the patient feel more relaxed. They know they they know that something is going to touch, like we're going to touch them, uh, so they won't they won't get too too like uh, excited. Now you put your finger, uh, retract the lip, retract the buckle, uh, and then you go into like behind the tuberosity. And then you tilt your finger and then you press what's called K point, which is found by Professor Koshima in Japan. It's a reflex point for jaw opening and swallowing. But right after they open their jaw and they swallow one time, they would close their mouth again. So you would need something for the patient to bite onto. Uh, in all the guidelines in special care dentistry, uh, they recommend this uh, open wide mouth rest, which is a, which is a foam, like EVA foam with a thin layer of wooden uh, in the middle. Uh, it's soft enough, it doesn't hurt the jaw and the, and the tooth. If you place it properly, don't place it on the front uh, teeth, place it like on the posterior teeth. Uh, and it's not, it's, it's soft enough and it's strong enough so the patient cannot destroy it easily. Okay. If uh, for mouth prop, I don't really recommend if the patient has like behavioral or psychological symptoms, uh, they would they would chew uh, multiple times and, and they can also choke on this uh, uh, mouth prop as well, even though you have the floss with it. You have to fight with the patient and if they are like difficult patient cannot uh, open their mouth easily, then there might be some, some incident. Uh, and with the mouth gap, Patient with cognitive impairment, they don't like the mouth gap as at all because the of the handle that would place on their cheek. And also, once we already open, if the patient bite down multiple times, it, it doesn't really work. So mouth rest would be the one that that can can hold the, the strength of the of the bite. And always have oximeter. And if the patient has high blood pressure. Uh, monitor the blood pressure uh, by having the cuff uh, all the time during the treatment and you measure it every 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. Patient with uh, dialysis, uh, they would have a, a shunt, a vascular access on their arms. So do not uh, measure blood pressure on that side of uh, on that arm. In many countries, they would wear a wristband but like in Thailand, 
they, they, we don't have a wristband uh, for them yet. So you have to be very careful. Like sometimes uh, the, the children of the patient is waiting in the lobby and the patient come into the room alone and they don't like, they follow every command. So, so sometimes they don't tell us that they have this uh, vascular access on their arms. Uh, for Parkinson disease, now uh, there are more and more people getting this deep brain stimulation uh, place. Uh, the good thing about this machine is that you can turn it off. So if you turn it off, uh, you'll be safe. But if you don't turn it off, the heat can burn the brain. The heat from all this uh, equipment that we use in the, in the dental clinic. So it's uh, like fatal, it's very dangerous if you don't turn it off. Uh, but if the patient has this, this uh, DBS placed only like less than a month ago, you have to consult the physician to titrate the anti parkinsonism uh, medication before you turn off this machine so that uh, the medication is at the level enough to control the, the tremor and the rigidity of the patient. Uh, different from the deep brain stimulation machine, uh, all the implant device uh, related to heart problem, you cannot turn it off. Uh, but now, it about 10 years ago, I think the development of the of, of this device has improved a lot. They have a like titanium shield. So when like when I was in undergrad, uh, we were taught not to use so many things in the dental clinic if, if the patient's on pacemaker or, or like um, any implanted cardiovascular device. But right now, I think the the the, the shield of this of this device has improved a lot. But to make sure they would have a card with them, uh, and this card would would tell the model of the device, would tell the day that they had it implanted, would tell the like all the details of the model. So you can look up. So now you can just like Google and look up uh, whether this model is compatible for using like uh, Apex locator, ultrasonic scaler, or just normal drilling, okay? So it depends on the model and how long they have it placed. Uh, just look up the details uh, online. Now it's very convenient. And if the patient has medical emergency, uh, and even though they have osteoporosis or osteopenia, make sure that you use the same uh, CPR protocol, because if you don't press, uh, deep enough, you won't, you won't get into an uh, aorta, so you cannot uh, uh, help the patient. But be careful with the red color area, which is the costal cartilage that is uh, usually like calcified. So you can you can break that red area. But if you place uh, your hand in the in the according to the uh, CPR protocol, just use the regular protocol, even though the patient has has osteoporosis. And at our, our school, we try to teach them about how to ease the access of the patient. Uh, so we invited uh, instructors from uh, faculty of architecture to teach us how to proper design uh, the ramp or the, the interior of the clinic. We invited uh, instructor from physiotherapists to help our students learn how to proper uh, transfer the patient from wheelchair to the dental chair. We also invited the critical care nurse to help us teach how to take care of people with ventilator, the chest PT to help us how to do, like to clear the lung, the patient aspirated. So this is it. So this is the picture of my two patients, uh, specialist patient, but they can take very good care. Of, their caregivers can take very good care of them too. So welcome any, any questions and I'll answer. Thank you. Good, Matana, thank you so much. Um, that was a great lecture, really insightful and um, really lots of very good uh, tips and advice. Um, I'll just hand you over to our panel for any comments or questions. Uh, Jacob, I wonder whether I could start with you. Thank you, thank you, Professor Roman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Matana, for the wonderful uh, um, lecture and very insightful and very explain you have uh, gone through uh, every equipment that is essential to care for a special needs patient. Thank you for that. 
Uh, just uh, would you like to touch on how, uh, as a general practitioner, dental practitioner, if we are called to look into a palliative care patient, uh -huh. is there any protocols for that? Okay, yes. Yeah. So, so palliative care uh, patients, we can be part of the team and we can help a lot with uh, the comfort of the patient to reduce the pain. Uh, usually, we don't have to do like the pain, they have the pain ladder, how to manage the pain. So that would be in charge of the palliative care team. But what we can help from my experience is how to do, uh, how to fight the dry mouth. Because the dry mouth is the really, really pain, uh, like is the important part of patient at the end of life that they suffer a lot from dry mouth. And if we are not going to step in to help, they would usually try to sip, uh, some water or, or suck on the iced, iced uh, cube. But then if they have also aspiration uh, or dysphagia, swallowing difficulty problem, they would aspirate all this liquid. And then they would, they would have to cough it out. And then that would increase a lot more suffering for them, like lower the oxygen intake. And then they will feel like very tired from all that aspiration. Uh, we can help them with this, like, you know, like saliva substitute and help with the cleaning the mouth and also uh, reduce the, the infection, not to kill them, but just to, to lower the pain and, and increase comfort. And in cancer patient uh, with like, with the tumor, like head headache tumor that's not properly treated, uh, actually we can help like prescribe metrodinazole gel uh, or just, you know, like put it out from the capsule and place it on the tumor to reduce the smell of the tumor as well, to reduce like all this narrow bacteria. And also help with the, work with the palliative care team for the pain control. Good, lovely, thank you. Um, Callum, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Matana, that was a very nice lecture. Um, sometimes students and dentists worry when they put their fingers into the mouth of some special care patients, they worry that they're going to, to bite their finger. And uh, what have you found over the years that has helped to avoid having your fingers bitten? Okay, so, so uh, if we look up uh, into some guidelines, uh, some guidelines recommend like uh, a silicone or plastic cover your finger, but I, I don't really like to use it because it's not, you cannot go like deep into the mouth. So what I do is just, just be quick and use this, uh, try to retract, retract the, the, the lips and the, the buccal mucosa out and use it open wide mouth rest. So the mouth rest helps a lot and, yes. and you, yeah, you won't get uh, bitten easily. And if the patient mm -hmm. is needed some oral sedation, so then you would prescribe oral sedation before, before seeing them. Yeah. Right. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, one more question. Um, how do you think about the use of ART, atraumatic restorative treatment, with some of these yeah. patients, especially when you might be visiting them at home, for example? Yes, ART is very useful. I think it's, it's globally accepted now. So we, we use a lot of ART techniques, whether it's uh, with or without drilling, but we use a lot of, of GI. Yeah. Yeah. And also combination with silver diving fluoride as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's really helpful. And I think Tamasat University is the global center for the silver smart with all the work that was being done by your former dean. Um, her team. Team. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, can I just ask you about training? Um, for me, um, special care dentistry is very much about training the whole team working together. And I just wondered whether you could just give us some insight into uh, how you undertake training. Uh, two particular areas I find as useful. One is uh, lifting the patient either with a hoist or just lifting them up. Uh, the team have to all know what to do without causing a problem. And the second is uh, a common problem is choking. Um, 
uh, dry mouth, dysphagia, um, water in the mouth, uh, all that can often create choking. And mm -hmm. again, I think the team need to know how to react to that. I wonder whether you could talk about training of your team and particularly yes. how you would take those two situations. Okay. Um, the training of my team, so my team right now would be like a vet students and also dentists, uh, but so we, we, we got proper training from also physical therapists, from the rehab physicians, uh, and also, but for the undergrad level, they just know the theory, but they don't get to, to practice, ex they get to practice only transferring patients, but they don't get to practice like, uh, like uh, how to do chest percussion, that kind of stuff, but for, for postgrad, so we teach uh, transferring patient with or without a hoist. And also we teach like uh, proper chest uh, PT management. And also we trade with the rehab physician on how to prevent uh, aspiration as well. Okay. No, that's really, really helpful. I think training and working as a team is yes. one of the key uh, aspects. Jacob, Callum, is there any comments or further comments or questions you would like to ask? Not from me, thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Prof. Prof. Raman, uh, Dr. Matana, you spoke about uh, domiciliary care. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, is there any special informed consent uh, aspects that we have to look into when we are uh, doing this kind of a service from the informed consent that we get from the patient or the family? So whether it's a whether it's a on site like at the clinic or domiciliary, I think the informed consent would be would be the same thing. But this is like cultural issue as well. I'm not sure in, in, in Indonesia or in Malaysia is the same or in Cambodia is the same. But like for Thai people, consent is not like doctors still had a lot of authorities. Which is not a nice thing, but they, but but we do, and the patient uh, do not actually care much about uh, written consent, but we do get verbal consent, and whether it's uh, at the clinic or whether it's at home, is is autonomy of the patient is key, so we always have the verbal consent. Okay, good. Well, it's been really entertaining and so uh, thoughtful. The lecture was really helpful. So I want to thank our panelists, Professor Callum Durwood and Dr. Jacob John, and our speaker, um, Matana Katarut Ratad. Uh, I'll get that better as uh, a pronunciation. But Matana, thank you so much. Uh, it's been really kind of you to give up your time and to give us this lecture. Um, and with that, we'll draw to a close and uh, and we'll say goodbye to everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.